Praise the Lord. It is so good to be in the Lord's house today. What an awesome time of worshiping our Lord together. I want you to take your Bibles, if you have a copy of God's Word, turn with me, please, in the book of Psalms. Look with me in Psalm 139. And uh, today we're continuing our series, Be Sure, God's Sure Answers in a Questioning World. And today I want to talk to you about how you can be sure about why life matters. We're going to look at Psalm 139 and see what the Word of God specifically has to say about the sanctity of human life. It's one of the biggest questions that people have. Why does human life matter? Another way of ask, or answering, asking the same question is what do followers of Jesus Christ mean when we say that we believe in the sanctity of human life? And that question is the number one issue that God's people say they want answers about. According to researcher George Barna, 91% of spiritually active Christians want to know what the Bible teaches about abortion and the sanctity of human life. Because our ideas have consequences. And what we believe inevitably shapes what we do and who we are. And so today we're going to look at the pages of Scripture, specifically Psalm 139, to answer the question, what does God's Word have to say about the sanctity of human life? I want you to stand with me as we read God's Word together. Psalm 139. Now we're going to focus on verses 13 through 16 of this psalm. But I want us to begin by looking at the very first verse of this psalm, the words of David. This is a psalm that David wrote and as David writes, he expresses how deeply God knows him, how well God understands who he is. Notice what he says in verse 1 of the text. He says, O oh Lord, you have searched me. You've sought out every part about me. You have searched me and known me. It's just a reminder to every one of us. God knows the deepest parts of who we are. He knows our fears. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our insecurities. He knows our internal makeup. He knows who we are and how we are and why we do what we do. And then moving down into verse 13 of this psalm, David says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. This is the word of God. Will you join with me as we pray? Father in heaven, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for this good day that you've given us. And Lord, I ask that you would move me out of the way and God, speak a word to your people in this place today. Lord, show us the value of human life. And Lord, show us who you are. And Lord, how you care about who we are. And Lord, we'll give you glory and honor for everything that you do. For we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. And church, if you agree with that prayer, will you say amen? Amen. You may be seated. Our ideas have consequences. What we think, our ideas, the way we look at the world, our ideas have consequences. Back in 1920, two German professors, one was a jurist lawyer, the other was a psychiatrist. Two German professors wrote a 132-page book, short book, and in that book they introduced an idea. The idea that they introduced has a German name. The German name is Lebensen Vertus Leben. It's a German term, Lebensen Vertus Leben, that means life unworthy of life. Life that is not worth life. And these two authors, these two academics, said that some living people who were brain damaged or mentally ill or otherwise intellectually deficient or physically deficient were a moral and financial burden on society and therefore as a result 
disposable. And in this relatively short book, they made the argument that these lives were unworthy of life. Ideas have consequences. They wrote that book in 1920. In 1933, 13 years after the publication of that book, Adolf Hitler took the oath of office as Chancellor of the Third Reich in Germany. And with his ascendancy into power, the sickening idea of life unworthy of life became official policy. Now, what I'm about to tell you is horrific, but it's true. Life unworthy of life. The killing started quietly with one child. One child, an infant, born blind, with one leg and part of one arm missing, apparently with mental developmental issues. And this infant was ordered by Hitler's personal physician to be killed in a hospital. And from there, the child killing program in Germany expanded. Centers were established. They usually gave them inoffensive, innocuous names. They referred to them as children's specialty institutions or even therapeutic convalescent institutions. But make no mistake, they were killing centers. Doctors and administrators proceeded as if the children were receiving medical care. They would bring them there because they had some type of mental or physical issue and children were kept in the institution for a few weeks and then a barbiturate was given repeatedly over two or three days until the child lapsed in, into continuous sleep and died. Families didn't know what was happening to their children. They would receive letters of condolence, usually signed with a fictitious doctor's name, and with ordinary diseases such as pneumonia given as the cause of death. The criteria for killing so-called defective children continually expanded. Eventually, the practice extended from killing children to killing adults and included killing whole groups of people, including six million European Jews, all because their lives were considered unworthy of life. Again, our ideas have consequences. And when we begin to devalue life, whether that's life in the womb or life because of someone's mental capacity or life because of old age, when we start to devalue life, then we start to end lives that God doesn't want to end. And we place ourselves in a position God never intended us to be in. If we believe that human life is just a biological accident resulting from the processes of natural selection and evolution, then atrocities like the ones I've described can be rationalized and accepted and even celebrated, and they have been. But if we believe that life is a gift from God, and we do, and if we believe that human life is a special creation of God, and we do, then it changes everything about how we view life from conception in the womb throughout life to the end of natural life. And so what does the Bible have to say about life? What does the Bible have to say about the sanctity of human life? A good place to begin is the psalm that we've just looked at, Psalm 139. In verse 1, David says, Lord, you have searched me and known me. God, you know all about me. And then beginning in verse 13 of the text, David begins to show under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God who moved him along to write each word that we read. He begins to talk about what God has done in establishing human life. In this beautiful psalm, we see a simple fact. God has endowed human life with sanctity and sacredness. And from that simple fact, Psalm 139 teaches several other truths about human life that I would like you to consider with me this morning as we look at the Word of God. First of all, the Bible shows us this. Human beings uniquely bear the image of God. That's something that God wants you to know about your life and every other life. Every other human life. Human lives uniquely bear the image 
of God. In Psalm 139, verse 13, David wrote, You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. David understood that God had formed and fashioned his body. That means that God made you. That means God designed you. He wove your arteries and nervous system together. He fashioned your muscles and all the structures of your body. He put together your whole mental and emotional and physical, everything about your personality and who you are, including every part of you, your facial features, your hair color, the color of your eyes, all the way down to your toenails and fingernails, your eyelashes and your eyebrows, and whether your earlobe directly attaches to your head or whether you got that little hangy down thing on the side. Every part of you, God put together because God gave you life. And when God gave you life, when God formed you and fashioned you, the Bible says that God made you in his image. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, as God is describing his creation, God describes what many have called the crown jewel of his creation, and that's the creation of men and women in his image. Next week, we're going to talk more in depth about this verse of Scripture and what it teaches. But listen to the words of Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. The Bible says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. What separates human beings from the rest of the created world? What separates human beings from the animal world? From from a biological perspective, our bodies function in much the same way as the bodies of, of animals function. Our neurological system works much like that of a dog or a cat. Our cardiovascular system is not substantially different from that of a gorilla. Our gastrointestinal system follows the same basic principles of that of a fox or a raccoon. And so some people will look at those similarities and say, well, see, those things, those similarities show that we as human beings evolved upward from the lower animals. But from a biblical perspective, we say, no, the similarities show that all of creation has the same creator. Somebody ought to say amen right there. All of creation has the same creator. And the Lord God who created everything created us, and our God used similar frameworks to sustain life in all his creatures. Art experts will tell you that simple line drawings in some of the journals of Leonardo da Vinci have the same stylistic and design elements as some of his greatest masterpieces. Why? Because both those informal sketches that he wrote in the margins and his greatest works of art have the same artist, and so there are similarities. The same is true with God's creatures. Human beings bear things in common with the rest of creation because the same divine designer and creator created us. Even so, if human beings are similar to other creatures, what makes us different? Well, look again in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Here's what God says about you as a human being that he doesn't say about any other life form. You are made in the image of God. That's what makes you different. That's what makes you special. That's what gives you value. You are made in the image of God. The Hebrew word for image in Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 refers to something that is similar to the thing it represents. In significant ways, you are similar to the God who created you. You are made in his image. Being made in the image of God means that we can know God and God can know us. Being made in the image of God means that we can have a relationship with God in a way that no other creation can. And the image of God in humanity, though marred and flawed by sin, is present in all of humanity. The baby formed in the mother's womb is made in the image of God. Of God, and therefore that life is precious. Though the baby is unborn, even as the baby is still being formed, the baby is being made in the image of God. The baby 
in the mother's womb bears the image of God. And the elderly man in the nursing home whose mind is demented and is unable to speak anymore or recognize people anymore, he still bears the image of God and his life is precious. No matter what our age, no matter our health, no matter our mental or physical capacity, all human beings bear the image of God. That's a wonderful thing about you. You reflect the image of God. You can have a relationship with him. You can know him. That's why Jesus Christ, God's son, left heaven and came to earth and died on the cross to pay the price for your sin because your life matters to God. Being made in the image of God means that you can love him and be loved by him. And so the word of God shows us human beings uniquely bear the image of God. And then there's a second truth about every human life revealed in this passage. Number two, God has created human life with dignity and value. Because we bear God's image, our lives have dignity and value. Look in Psalm 139, verse 14. There the Bible says, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. The Bible says that human life created by God is fearful and wonderful. (laughs) I am fearfully and wonderful. And wonderfully made. That's true of you. It was true of David, but it's true of you too. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Those words show us that human life has dignity. Now now take your Bibles and turn just a few pages back. Also in the book of Psalms. Look in Psalm 8. Psalm 8 is another psalm of David. And there David asks a question and then answers a question about every human being. Psalm 8 verse 4 contains the question. David asked the Lord, Lord, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Why do you pay attention to to people, God? Why do you take care of human beings? And then the next verse answers the question. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. Why does God care for humanity? Why are we special to him? The Bible says he has made us a little lower than the heavenly beings. Some of, the, some of your Bible translations may say he's made you a little lower than the angels. The Hebrew text is actually even stronger than that. You have made him a little lower than God. You've made man a little lower than the heavenly beings. And then notice what the Bible says, and crowned him with glory and honor. The Bible says that you as a human being are crowned with glory. In the Old Testament, the word glory is the Hebrew word kabod. Kabod. It comes uh, in the negative form in the word Ichabod. You're probably familiar with that name, Ichabod. Ichabod is, is the negative form of the word kabod. It means no glory. And so Ichabod Crane in the story of the legend of Sleepy Hollow, the Ichabod Crane means no glory crane, somebody without any glory. But the Bible says God has crowned you with kabod, with glory. And that word kabod or glory has a root word meaning heaviness. To have glory means to have weight and significance. When we talk about human dignity and value, we are saying that every human being has something significant and glorious about them. Not because of anything we've done, but because God has crowned us with glory and honor. We have significance. We have value. The secular worldview doesn't see it that way. The secular worldview says you're just a mass of tissue and somehow you got cognition and, and you're able to walk around and do things, but, but, but you're not the glorious creation of God. In his book, Flesh and Machines, MIT professor Rodney Brooks writes that a human being is nothing but what he calls, and I quote, a big bag of skin full of biomolecules interacting by the laws of physics and chemistry. And that's, that's all human beings are in the secular worldview, just biological machines and nothing more. But the Bible teaches 
that every human life is created in God's image. And as a result, every human life possesses a God-given dignity and value. And that's true of you. The way God made you. God didn't make you wrong. God didn't mess up. Yes, we're marred by sin, but we are made in God's image, crowned with glory and honor, and we have significance and value because of that. So when does human life start? If every human life is in God's image, if every human life has dignity and value, when does human life start? And that's a crucial question that our text also answers. Third, the Bible shows us this. Human life, according to God's word, begins before birth in the womb. And that is an absolutely unassailable truth of scripture. From conception, God's word describes an unborn baby as a human person. Psalm 139 verse 15 says, My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. David is talking about his development in his mother's womb. He says, my frame, literally my frame means my bones, my skeleton. David knew that when his skeletal system was formed in the depths of the earth, you might want to underline that phrase. It's a Hebrew expression that simply means the womb. Sometimes when the, uh, the Hebrew speakers were, were talking about their mother's womb, the phrase they used was the depths of the earth. He says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, in the mother's womb. David understood that as he was being put together in his mother's womb, God saw him and God knew him. So many places in Scripture uphold the truth That human life does not begin simply at birth, but at conception. God knows the unborn child. God has a plan for the unborn child. God had a purpose for you before you were born. In Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, God speaks to Jeremiah the prophet and says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. The word formed there was used of a potter fashioning clay into a vase or other piece of pottery. In the womb, God says, before before you were in the womb, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. He was fashioning Jeremiah for his purposes. Now, I want you to take your Bibles and turn a few pages over. Look in the New Testament in Luke chapter 1, verse 41. There's, There's a verse in Luke chapter 1, verse 41 that we often read right past at Christmas time, but it's a verse of Scripture that speaks significantly of the fact that life begins in the womb. In Luke chapter 1, verse 41, the Bible describes John the Baptist, unborn and in the womb of his mother Elizabeth, leaping for joy when Mary, the mother of Jesus, came to visit. Listen to what the Bible says. Luke chapter 1, verse 41. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And there are several things that are significant in this text. The baby leapt. The baby was evidently able to to hear. The baby experienced the emotion of joy. But I want you to notice significantly that the baby in the womb is described as a baby. Luke chapter 1 verse 41 The baby leaped in her womb. That's the same word, baby, that's used elsewhere in Scripture to describe a newborn. And so the unborn baby was able to hear and respond. The unborn baby experienced the emotion of joy. And Scripture makes no distinction between a baby in the womb and a baby in its mother's arms. No distinction. Throughout Scripture, the Bible presents the unborn child. Not as, a mass of tish, not as a mass of tissue, not as a potential person, not as a part of the mother's body, but as an individual human being made in God's image. According to God, 
An unborn baby, though unborn, is most certainly a baby. And we work hard to protect babies. Think about all the things we do just to work to protect babies. You can't leave the hospital as a, as a parent of a newborn. You can't leave the hospital with your newborn baby unless you can prove that your car has been outfitted with a properly fitted, up-to-date child safety seat. They won't let you leave the hospital in your car because why? We protect babies. Families with small children child-proof our homes with safety latches on our kitchen cabinets and protective caps on all our electrical outlets. We fix it where we can barely operate our house. Why? To protect babies. We don't want them to electrocute themselves. We don't want them to get into something they shouldn't get into. We want babies to be safe. When our son was, I don't know, maybe he's about 13 years old. He's a young teenager and it was 4th of July and that year 4th of July was on a Sunday and we were driving home from church. In fact, we were driving to eat at a restaurant on the way home from church and Joshua said, hey, today daddy, I want to shoot off some fireworks. I said, you are not shooting off fireworks. I said, you are not lighting fireworks. He said, why can't I light a firework? I said, because up to this point in time in your life, your mom and I have done so many things to protect you, to protect your body. I said, I carried you, carried you around in a bucket. That's what I called his child care. I said, I carried you around in a bucket and, and, and to protect you. And we put you in the back seat of the car, facing the back. And we went through all of those things to protect your body. And I went through all the things that I had done. I said, you are not going to blow off one of your fingers today with a firecracker. We have protected your body. We got to the restaurant where we were eating. We saw some folks from our church. We said, we hope you have a four, happy 4th of July today. What are you doing? They said, we're going to shoot off some big firecrackers today. We still didn't let our son shoot off any firecrackers. Why? We protect our children's bodies. We want them to be safe. And yet, wherever abortion remains legal, an unborn baby may be in a very dangerous place, even in the mother's womb. We can praise the Lord for the recent overturn of Roe versus Wade, and we should be thankful to God for that today. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's give praise to the Lord. We, we praise God for that. But even so, the number of lives still lost to abortion each year, each day, each hour, each minute should break our hearts. Here's why. Every unborn child is a precious creation of God, made in God's image, whose life is sacred and valuable in the sight of the Lord. All human life is worthy of life because all human life is made by God in the image of God and is sacred to God. This past Friday in Washington, D.C., two-time Super Bowl champion and Hall of Fame coach Tony Dungy spoke at the 50th annual March for Life. Coach Dungy has been strong in standing for Jesus Christ, consistent in his walk with Christ, I believe, across the years. When I was in the Tampa Bay area and, and he was living there and so active there, it was just really, really encouraging to see his consistent walk with Christ. And he's taking a lot of heat from the media for his courage and standing for the sanctity of human life. Tony Dungy is a great example to us. And in his speech... Coach Dungy said this, and I quote, he said, it's amazing to me that God actually used football to shine some light on the subject of life for all of us. He continued, three weeks ago, during a game in Cincinnati, something happened that impacted our entire country. A young man, DeMar Hamlin, of the Buffalo Bills, made a routine tackle and his heart stopped beating right on the field, Dungy said. And then he continued, it could have been tragic, but something miraculous happened. He said the team medical staff rushed out, they got DeMar's heart started again, and then he said, but you know what? That wasn't the real miracle. The real miracle was the reaction of everyone to that. And then he began to note how sports announcers on television said, all we can do is pray. And social media was calling for people 
to pray. And people all over the country prayed. Then Coach Dungey continued, an unbelievable thing happened that night. A professional football game with millions of dollars of ticket money and advertising money on the line. That game was canceled. Why? Because a life was at stake and people wanted to see that life saved. Coach Tony Dungy concluded by saying, that should be encouraging to us. Because that's exactly why we're here today. Because every day innocent lives are at stake. The only difference is they don't belong to a famous athlete and they're not seen on national TV. But those lives are still important to God and in God's eyes. Every life is precious to God. Young and old, precious to God. Rich and poor, precious to God. Male and female, precious to God. Of every race and background, precious to God. Born and unborn, precious to God. Every life is precious and sacred to God. And so I want to suggest some practical ways that you as a follower of Jesus Christ can show that you value life. That life is precious to you in the same way it's precious to our God. Just some things that you can do. You may want to write some of these down, but more than that, I pray that you just prayerfully consider what God might have you do to show that life is precious to you. First thing, teach your children. Teach your children. Explain to them that they are made in God's image and treat them as precious gifts made in God's image. Teach them that God loves and has a purpose for every person. Teach your children. A second thing you can do, pray for a pro-life ministry. Whether that's a pregnancy care center or a children's home or an adoption agency or some other ministry that upholds life, lift up those ministries in your prayers. Something else you can do, support a pregnancy care center. One of the greatest gifts of God that God has given us in the state of Oklahoma is the Hope Pregnancy Center. I praise God for that ministry. And I'm thankful to God that Oklahoma Baptists support and sustain that ministry. Oklahoma is blessed by the Hope Pregnancy Care Center. And they're on the front lines standing for life and helping women and men in crisis pregnancies make decisions that honor life. In our post-Roe v. Wade world, pregnancy care centers continue to need our support perhaps more than ever. They're making a day-by-day difference in the lives of babies and parents. Something else you can do, support or consider becoming a foster or adoptive family. This is already happening among families here in our church, serving as foster families, looking for ways to adopt children in crisis situations. Children across the United States need families to be a part of for a short time or for a lifetime. Something else you can do, vote for pro-life candidates. Of all of the factors that we consider when we're voting, a candidate's position on abortion should be the primary deciding issue for believers. It's that important. Vote for for pro-life candidates. And then last, volunteer with a pregnancy care center or special needs ministry. We have a wonderful ministry for people with special needs here called Masterpiece. I'd love for more people to volunteer and be a part of that. And there's a pregnancy care center close by where you can volunteer. And already people from Quail Springs who are serving the Lord by serving at that pregnancy care center. They need people to stand in the gap and to make a difference and to affirm the dignity of every life. God values life. He values your life. And he values your life so much that he wants human life to go on forever and ever and ever. Have you ever thought about that? The reason that God has given us eternal life is because he values your soul. He values your life. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, and this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life, 
And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. And whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. It's just that simple. God wants you to have eternal life because he values your life. He loves you. And he's provided life through his son, Jesus. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus lived. That's why Jesus died on the cross and then rose again. He wants to save you and give you his gift of eternal life. 